use. You'll come to the podium. Yeah, okay, that's great. Good evening. I am going to invite a few more people to come up to these lovely white chairs here, if that's at all something that uh, can appeal to you. Good evening, what a wonderful group that has gathered here in the blessing of God's good creation. Welcome to Canadian Mennonite University for a face-to-face -face conversation on polarization, get over it. My name is Cheryl Pauls and I serve as president of CMU. Today and all days, we are honored to live and learn on the ancestral lands of Anishinaabe Cree and Dakota First Nations and on the homeland of the Red River Métis Nation. We are grateful for their stewardship of lands and water since ancient times and for the hospitality extended through the covenant of Treaty 1 of 1871. We acknowledge the truth of past harms and ongoing wrongs and seek reconciliation for the flourishing of Indigenous peoples and indeed all relations. CMU's face-to-face -face series engages long-standing yet timely matters not from postures of positions and sides, but from diverging starting points of life experience. Even tonight, with a formidable panel of political leaders, the conversation is not about partisan policy and debate, but rather how these leaders create collective ways forward by centering their work in relationships across difference. I'm pleased to welcome our host for this evening, who in turn will introduce uh, both the topic and our panelists. Our host this evening is Dr. Jody Duick Reed. Dr. Duick Reed is Assistant Professor of Conflict Resolution Studies at CMU and to date mostly through our Menno Simons College campus. Jody is a facilitator, instructor, social activist, and researcher. Now, she brings lots of practical experience to this work and also to this evening's conversation. She's worked, for example, on the US-Mexico border as Associate for Migration and Peacebuilding for Mennonite Central Committee and, in, and done similar work both in Chile and Bolivia. And of course, that continues in the classroom and many other places. Jody, please welcome and, and take us forward into the evening. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you so much, Cheryl. I'm delighted to be here tonight to listen to and delve into stories with our honored guests. Stories connect us, bring us heart, allow us to feel and to learn. Personal stories often help to bring us together, to see beyond the dividing lines. But to open this place as a space of storytelling in community this evening, I wanna invite you to take one moment to look around you and to greet those around you, to connect ever so briefly face to face. Please greet one another. Thank you. Thanks so much. In our first time of being together uh, fully in an in-person event, we're really excited to be here. And I want to share a bit about the context of polarization and the importance of storytelling before I introduce you to our panelists. 
It's become trite to say it, but the pandemic divided us. Stay two meters or six feet apart, wear a mask for protection, don't host or attend large gatherings. These were our instructions for life to live by during the most difficult times of the pandemic. These physical separations, while temporary, have led to looser social bonds. More things to disconnect us and less opportunities to connect. And tonight we're in Marpec's Marpec Commons, as I said, for the first face-to-face, in-person, uh, in several years. And it's part of an emphasis that CMU has to strengthen our social connections to get us talking about difficult things and to find hope in our conversations. As an instructor, I feel so, excuse me, I facilitate learning with university students in conflict resolution and peace building. And I often invite students to share stories Stories that have shaped them into the people that they are. Stories that invert paradigms and present conflict from the lens of an opposing party. And very regularly, at the end of class, I ask students to share a story about what they will take home, what they learn today in class. I try to model that by storytelling by telling them what I might share with my wife or my six-year-old when I go home. And after our gathering tonight, I may challenge you to figure out what story you will share. Storytelling as a way of relating, a way of learning can have a powerful effect on our lives. Tonight, we enter a time of storytelling. And we're used to stories that are kind of negative, stories that, uh, where there are big divides between people. Uh, tonight, we're gonna hear stories of overcoming, of bridging those concerns. Get Over It, the subtitle of the event for tonight, is a cheeky way of saying, let's change the conversation, at least for a night, and focus on the positive and what we can learn from communities, uh, excuse me, from community leaders and how they work at these difficult things. Our society has come to accept that polarization is the way we relate, and we'd like to anchor our orientation tonight to hope and the possibility of relating across differences. To strengthen our resolve, our skills, and build our hope, we need to hear stories of transformation, and tonight we are gifted stories from local leaders. My hope for tonight is that you will find heart, humanity, and motivation, feel the importance of storytelling and building bridges, perhaps gain a nugget or two of wisdom to take away about hope, about um, community. And we hope that all may take the opportunities given, even if they seem small, to climb that divide and know that change is possible. So I'm honored to introduce you to these illustrious community leaders on my side and speakers whose publicly available biography inform these introductory comments. To my left, Minister Kelvin Gertzen, the current Minister of Justice and Attorney General, Government House Leader, and the Minister responsible for Manitoba Public Insurance. Minister Gertzen has been the MLA for Steinbach since 2003 and is a member of the Progressive Conservative Party of Manitoba. Minister Gertsen is a lifelong resident of Steinbeck and graduated from the University of Manitoba with degrees in economics, commerce, and law. As a community leader, he served as vice president of both the Steinbeck Arts Council and the Steinbeck Food Bank, Helping Hands. Welcome, Minister Gertsen. Next to Minister Gertsen, we have Mr. Dugald Lamont, the MLA for St. Boniface since 2018. He's also the leader of the Manitoba Liberal Party. He also is a graduate of the University of Manitoba with degrees in English. Mr. Lamont has worked as a writer, editor, and policy analyst in the private and public sectors, including employment at the Manitoba Museum, Western Economic Diversification, and Indigenous Affairs Manitoba. As a community leader, he has volunteered with Gott Bannock, and help to raise funds for local nonprofits. Welcome, Mr. Lamont. <laughs> Mr. Jamie Moses, the MLA for St. Vital since 2019, is a member of the New Democratic Party and currently serves as the NDP's critic for economic development and training and NDP's spokesperson on affordability issues. Prior to his election, Mr. Moses worked in the financial and agricultural sectors. He also graduated from the University of Manitoba with a degree in agribusiness. And as a community leader, he has volunteered with the Glenwood Community Center and the Glenwood Parent Advisory Council and as a basketball coach. 
welcome Mr. Moses. Ms. Jamie Menzies is a policy analyst for the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs and also a very recent inductee into the North American Indigenous Athletics Hall of Fame, the Manitoba Indigenous Female Coach of the Decade, and also a volleyball coach here at CMU. Ms. Menzies has a BS from the University of Winnipeg and a law degree from the University of Manitoba. As a community leader, she is the president of Volleyball Manitoba's Board of Directors and is the Métis Chair of Manitoba Aboriginal Sport and Recreation Council's Board. Welcome, Ms. Menzies. The format for this evening is as follows. I will invite input from the panelists in the order in which they're sitting, and we'll hear some stories from them for approximately three minutes. I'll step back uh, into the frame, to frame question two, and on the second round, we'll start with Ms. Menzies and go back to Minister Gertzen. And then on the third round, we'll start in the middle. At the end of the input time, we'll be open to more dialogue among the panelists, as well as a, a question and answer period. The first question uh, is an invitation to share a story of something you've done that's been successful in getting through a perceived or real impasse or a destructive form of polarization. The story could be recent, it could be from years ago, it could be a large scale or a much smaller event. So in simpler terms, the first question is this. Please share a personal story that illustrates how you have overcome polarization to engage with people who think or act differently than you. And I'll pass it right on. Thank you, Mr. Gerson. Yeah, thank you uh, very much. Pleasure to be here this evening. My wife Kim has joined me as well. Uh, so it's a pleasure to have her here. It's great to be here with these uh, panelists. We look like a bad Mennonite choir, but that's okay. We'll start singing later on. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to polarization, I'll give you uh, maybe a general than a specific. Uh, I've been the uh, house leader for I think about 15 years out of the 20 years that I've been elected in the Manitoba legislature. And the house leader works more than anybody else with other political parties. And so I work with the House Leader for the NDP and for the Liberals to try to organize the legislature. And that can sometimes put you in a, in a lot of conflict because you have different goals that you're trying to achieve in the legislature. But really for me, what I've tried to do in terms of approaching it is, I start from the position that the other elected officials that I'm working with um, are there for good intentions. They're there for good reasons. And I think we don't do that all the time as, as politicians. We jump a little bit too quickly to the motive of other individuals. But if you start from the position, because it's been my experience in the legislature, that everybody essentially that I've worked with is there for the right reasons. We may have very different ideas in terms of how to solve problems, but I truly believe people get there for the right reasons. So working with opposition house leaders over the last 15 years, um, I've been able to build good relationships with individuals. I've learned about their kids. I've learned about challenging times they've gone through. I've gone to some of the funerals for their family members, and it really is about relationships. It's really hard to dislike somebody when you get to know them as a person. You still might not agree with their views, but when you get to know them as a person, it's really critical. And then I think language matters. You know, uh, when I got appointed as Minister of Justice a little more than a year ago, a little thing called the Trucker Convoy showed up in, in Winnipeg and across Canada, and it was difficult. And there was a lot of difficult discussions about it. One of the things I tried to do early on, though, was to say and to say to our caucus, I'm going to talk about conduct and not try to condemn. And so as a Minister of Justice, and it was my role to speak about it, I'll be very quick to say, people shouldn't be able to block things like downtown Winnipeg. You can't block the border like Emerson. People need to be able to get across the border and it's important for trade. But I really stayed away from the motivations or why people were doing things or to condemn individuals individually or personally. Because it's really tough to talk to somebody after you've done that and it's tried to, tough to come to a, a conclusion when you've tried to put a motive onto somebody. But it is clear to talk about the conduct. And I think in Winnipeg, we were relatively successful. And I will now do go listen up, because I'm going to credit Justin Trudeau on something. 
Um, he, uh, I know you're ready for this, right? He's not my boss. Yeah. <laughs> he, um, he said last week, I think in response to an inquiry that came out, that he, he regretted some of the language that he used. And I give him credit for that because we as politicians don't often do that enough. And to step back and say, I think maybe I went too far or I, I, I phrased something in the wrong way. And, and he talked about how he may have used different language in, in responding to what happened last year. And I give him credit for that because I think it goes along way in speaking to the fact that sometimes we make mistakes and we say things the wrong way. So I'm on that uh, curve of learning too and I'm looking forward to uh, hearing other comments. Was it me? Uh, the, the question was about how I deal with people who think or act differently than me and I think that's most people. Um, but <laughs> and, and bear in mind when I when I I actually could tell a whole bunch of stories about just conflict within my own party but bear in mind when I was elected leader of the Manitoba Liberal Party I ran against I did not have a seat and I ran against three sitting MLAs who did not vote for me. And I won on Saturday night and I had to go to work for them on Monday. And my campaign manager at the time said, you have no carrots and you have no sticks. You had better find a way to come up with uh, some of both. And so part of that, uh, <laughs> but so part of that is, is I had to listen to people and I had to, I had to persuade them to trust me. Uh, and that was a challenge because trust Trust is a thing that's very, very hard to gain, uh, and it's extremely easy to lose. So that's uh, that's one of the big challenges uh, around the convoy. Look, I was getting lots of emails. Um, uh, some of the, look, I, uh, the joke I make about Justin Trudeau is that he's not my boss, but lots of people think he is. So people don't make a distinction between they they just think I'm a liberal, right? So I was getting all sorts of emails pleading with me to as if you know, I don't have his his I can't text him and ask him to do anything. Um, but it was also, you know, if I would try to respond to people, I was getting threats and other people were getting threats, but I did generally try to, <laughs> actually I'd heard somebody on Instagram that if you try to change the topic, so if somebody was sending me threats and I said, well that, and, and I looked at their Instagram profile and I said, you know, that looks like a nice cottage, is it yours? And he didn't, he didn't, it didn't help. But when it came to, <laughs> and it turned out he was, he was in, he was in British Columbia, but I mean, I did actually have to file a complaint, but there were. But the thing about it is that even when people were sending emails, I would. I actually tried to send emails back and say, "Well, look, this is why I'm. This is why this." And I sometimes very long emails, and I tried to make them pretty fulsome. And sometimes they would work, and sometimes they wouldn't. Um, but there was a guy who called screaming uh, racist remarks and obscenities, left this long message at the Manitoba Liberal headquarters. And I actually called him back and gave him, and had a 45 minute or an hour conversation. And look, he's a guy who is, he's, he's venting. And I think one of the things when we talk about polarization, I think it's driven by desperation. And so, uh, like real desperation. So whether people can actually afford to eat, whether, and, and, and a complete sense of lack of control over their own lives. And I think that's part of what happened during the pandemic is that people had felt they had no control over their own lives. And, and, and often they didn't. And often it was because um, if they ended up going around, they could make people very sick and people could die. And that was a challenge communicating that. And, and, to, for, and, and, and I don't ever discount, I, I think one of the things to remember, always remember is that everybody, even though we don't, don't agree, everybody can feel pain, everybody can feel suffering. And it's remembering that, remembering to treat people fundamentally as a human being. Um, and not just as a member of a group, because that tends to instantly r reduce somebody. The highest, the highest way we can appreciate somebody, as, as, as Calvin said, is as a person, as a person with full feelings and, and like you. And that's, that's one of the, it's a challenge, but, and, and part of it is I've reached out to people in my own party and I've reached out, sort of Lincoln had the idea of reaching out to a team of rivals. You reach out to people you fought with and you try to bring them back on board. And it, it, it actually makes a difference because they will provide you with a perspective you need. Because I, like I'll, I'm never going to be, it's like a stop clock. I'm, like, I'm lucky if I'm right twice a day. Um, but, and I'm going to be wrong some of the time and the others will be right. And it's important for me to listen. Uh, thank you. Um, I am uh, really glad to be here today. And I just wanted to say that I'm really welcome. I'm glad to be welcomed in this space and I thank our hosts for having us here. Um, I'm also glad just to see a crowd of people. I know a lot of us haven't been able to do this. And so it's really nice to see uh, this space full of people who are engaged in a topic that you know sometimes you might think is a little bit touchy, 
But I think the fact that we're here gathered discussing this just proves that our community is really ready to uh, be involved in this and be involved in breaking down these sort of barriers and break down the polarization that we might often see or hear about in the, in the news. I think we're all ready to move past those sort of things. I'll just share a brief story. So prior to my involvement in politics, uh, I was, as mentioned, I worked in agriculture. And so, uh, you know, I worked at the Canadian Wheat Board being uh, someone in, the mid, in their mid-20s, a black guy who works primarily with, you know, kind of, you, you think, typical white male farmers in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, you think there's not a lot of commonality there. And, you know, on the, on the surface there isn't. Um, but I can remember a particular case where we were working with a group of farmers. And, and helping them on different uh, you know, aspects of, uh, of coordinating with the wheat board. And one farmer wasn't really responding as much in the group. And so I went up to him and I was approaching him about to ask what I could do to help. And before he, I got a chance to say anything, he said to me, what are you here for? In a very abrupt tone. And I could tell it was because of his presumptions of me and that I could not uh, be of any as used to him. And so I said, well, I'm here to help you if you let me. And I said that because I wanted to build a connection with him, that we both share the same goal of helping his farm be successful. I was, had my knowledge of the wheat board to add to his knowledge of his particular farm, and we could combine those things to make things better for his particular situation. I was able to create a framework there for us to actually start a dialogue. That wasn't part of our dialogue. We went on to have conversations and help him with his farm. But just those few words gave us a little bit of a commonality to create a framework to build on. And without that framework to build on, we would not have had a successful working relationship. So, and I think that sort of analogy goes with any uh, discussion we're having in our communities. You know, when we see these divisions in the media, we're discouraged. But if the more we talk, the more we can share our common goals, our common interests, our common values, it builds frameworks within polarized and divide, divided communities. And the more we build that framework, it allows us to have better communication, uh, and better um, relationships with each other, and uh, share our commonalities and move forward together as community. Hi there. Um, I would like to start by situating myself in this topic, um, and then I do have a story also. Um, but as I was considering how I wanted to approach this, um, I was thinking of a few things, and Jody kind of framed it. Let's move forward with hope and relate across differences. So I just want to unpack that for a moment before I get into my story. Um, first of all, moving forward in hope. This word hope can mean something different to everyone, and um, my partner and I talk about this word a lot, actually, um, because I think there's this perception that hope has to always mean happiness or ease, and I don't actually reap a lot of hope from ease and the status quo. Um, I reap hope from a group of people that are willing to be in a space and be critical of the norm, or people that are willing to approach a tough topic and think of ways that it can work the best for the most people. So um, polarization can be kind of an uncomfortable word, um, but I am encouraged by this space because I think we can approach differences in a critical way and it still be hopeful and from my perspective, more hopeful than, than not approaching some tough stuff. Um, so I wanted to start with that. Um, and the other thing that Jody started with was relating across differences. Now, I'm, I'm aware of the fact that I am um, the woman on the panel and the indigenous representative on this panel, so I think that I would be um, remiss not to address this word differences in in a certain way. Um, because I think that polarization can kind of be framed as two sides, two extreme sides of one issue. Um, but in a way I want, I want to think about it differently tonight, or I'm most comfortable thinking of it in a different way. 
And that way is that there is a dominant norm, a dominant culture, um, and then there are others. And that's kind of uncomfortable to talk about, but um, I'll just list a few ways that we understand um, culture. And the dominant culture would include kind of a capitalist mindset, um, would include you know, remnants of the patriarchy or a very real patriarchy. Um, in this space, maybe an Anabaptist culture, but in other spaces, I would say probably the Christian um, faith generally is the dominant culture. Um, you know, white folks or white presenting folks, which I am, that would be the dominant perspective or the dominant voice that is most often heard. Um, and so I could list those forever, but, but we all understand what the dominant culture is. Um, and I want to approach this idea of polarization tonight, conscious of the fact that that is the dominant view and that what we consider polar, a polar opposite in whatever direction um, might be considered the radical view, but it is in fact just a departure from the dominant culture. So that's kind of the approach that I want to come to this conversation. Um, and that may not always be popular, but um, I think I would, I think it's my job tonight to bring light to, you know, the indigenous perspective as well as some others. So um, the story that I'm gonna tell with maybe the 30 seconds left of my time, um, is a little bit close to home. It involves Cheryl, in fact. I've been a coach here with the women's volleyball team for five years. Um, and I was coming to the space, I'm not Mennonite, um, was very welcomed in that respect, but I'm not Mennonite. Um, I'm the only woman coach in the athletic department, and I'm also one of a, ver a, a handful of indigenous staff here. And so a few years into working here, I wrote a letter to the Dean of Student Life, also Charlie's here tonight, um, and the president and my athletic director. And I, I didn't really know them that well at that point, in fact, but I just raised um, ways that I thought CMU could treat a woman coach, indigenous folks, and non-Christian or non-Anabaptist folks better. Um, and I'll admit I was a little fiery when I was writing this letter. Um, and I was very pleased to find on the other end, Cheryl um, offered a meeting. And so all three folks were there, Cheryl and Charlie and all the people that I addressed the letter to. Um, and so I approached this as an indigenous woman, a coach, a woman in athletics who, you know, mostly it's male dominated. And I was being critical of an institution, um, which I think is okay to be. Um, but you know, after about three hours of conversation, um, I learned a lot from Charlie and Cheryl. They were willing to share pieces of themselves as individuals with me, but also the philosophy of the institution. Um, and so I was able to shift a little closer because I understood them. And they gave me a ton of space to teach them in a sense. And so we were just teaching each other about ourselves as individuals and also the communities and institutions we come from. And, um, you know, we left all having learned something um, and benefiting, um, but also feeling like more of a community than, than opposites on an issue. So um, I appreciate that of them, but also um, I think in there are some tactics for how to overcome polarization is, as was already mentioned by my fellow panelists, um, building relationships, um, being willing to be critical and be in the uncomfortable spots, um, and um, acknowledging differences and um, giving space to people's voices, which I felt that my voice was given space in that situation. So, thank you. Thank you so much, each of you. Um, really learning some interesting stories, and I'm seeing lots of themes running throughout um, your stories. For the second question, I want to pose, what story nurtures you in your ability or your willingness to work across differences? Perhaps a story from your childhood, perhaps a story uh, that's been in insightful for you as you've you know, been growing as people. 
So what story nurtures your ability or willingness to work with people on the other side of significant divides? And this time we'll start with Ms. Menzies and we'll come back this way. Okay. Um, okay, well, um, I will ex kind of let you in a little bit more on my identity here before I start. Um, I am Métis, my mother's Métis, and my father is of settler descent. Um, I've benefited from the privilege of his, of the intergenerational wealth that came with my father's family, um, but also have been very tied to my indigenous culture um, my whole life. But I'm also white presenting, so there's some conflicting things going on with my identity a little bit. Um, but I try to be conscious of the fact that I am both indigenous and white presenting in the spaces that I'm in. Um, and so this hasn't always been my approach, um, but in whichever space I am in, and I'm going to name a few, give a few examples, um, I try to be conscious of whether the onus is on me to uh, I'm going to use the word depolarize just because that's what we're talking about. Whether the onus is on me to be the heard or the listener. Um, and so, yeah, I guess just the strategy being who the onus is on to depolarize a situation because I don't believe every person in a space necessarily has that onus. Um, and I'm going to give a few examples. Um, I've been coaching for almost 20 years, and my, the athletes that I've had the chance to coach over the course of time, one of whom is here, hi Rachel, um, yeah, they've been one of my greatest examples in this respect, in fact. On every team, on every sports team, but every team, um, there's conflict. There are differing, differing views, um, interpersonal conflict and otherwise, um, and a strategy that I've used that was a lot of people use it, but um, I bring it from a traditional teaching, is a sharing circle. So I often have sharing circles with my teams, especially when there's a conflict, just to make sure that everyone's voice is heard. And this is a strategy for working through conflict in Indigenous nations. Um, and my athletes have taught me so much through those sharing circles. Um, because of how, I mean, most of my athletes have been anywhere between 11 to about 19 or 20 years old. and in that youth, just the, it, I'm always amazed at how they're willing to approach each other with open minds and open hearts, and to listen to each other, and to forgive each other, and to um, move forward as a team. And I feel like maybe as adults, we can learn from youth in a lot of ways, but certainly that way. So um, on the topic of who has the onus to depolarize in those contexts, um, I, if there is ever a conflict between an athlete and I, I acknowledge the fact that I'm in a position of authority, I'm in a position of perceived power, and I believe that I am the person that has to go further than halfway with my athletes in order to um, address a conflict and not meet in the middle necessarily um, because of my position of authority and power. Um, so I think that that filter can be applied to a number of things. In some contexts, I am in that position of authority and power. In other contexts, I believe that it is my voice that should be heard and prioritized. Um, and with respect to kind of my Métis identity, um, I'm often in spaces with people who have um, dealt with racism their whole lives or systemic discrimination in ways that I haven't. Um, and in that case, I would prioritize their voice over my own, and I would go further to address a conflict or a disagreement. Um, yeah, and so the examples are endless, but my point being that we just have to do some self-reflection and recognize um, our own privilege and power, or cases where our own voices should be um, heard. And I, I don't like to call that the radical voice as much as it's just the voice that maybe isn't heard as often should be lifted up, I think. Thanks. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> I just want to start by thanking you, Jamie, for that. Um, also because I know it's not always easy to uh, share personal identity stories in a group setting, so I just wanted to thank you for doing that. It's appreciated. 
Um, I wanted to just answer this by sharing, I guess, uh, a story that I think is very, especially growing up for me, was very impactful. And, I, and you all know, um, you know, Nelson Mandela. But you know, this growing up for me, you know, in the 80s and 90s, what he did was, you know, very impactful. And I think for a lot of people, the key part of that story is around how he, you know, sacrificed 26 of his years to go to jail for what he believed in for standing up against apartheid. But for me, that's not the most important or most impactful part of his story for me. I mean, he you know, fought against apartheid. He won that victory, which I think is you know, obviously incredible, nonviolently. But after he got out of prison and became president, what did he do? He forgave. He forgave those people who put him in jail, and he forgave those people who stood against black people in South Africa. And for me, that's the most impactful uh, thing. That is a story that really nurtures my willingness to go, uh, to go out and have new connections and, new, uh, and you know, make those leaps of faith with people who I might not have commonality with. Because at the end of the day, you know, we hope to bridge our divide. We hope that we can find a commonality and the areas where we disagree with it's my hope that I can live up to that example of uh, Nelson Mandela and be able to forgive. And I think now that I'm in a role of a politician, now that I'm in this, you know, being an MLA, you know, I think it's even a greater challenge and a greater responsibility for us to do that work. Because the greater responsibility that we have, the greater authority that we have, the greater impact and the greater positive impact our ability to forgive communities uh, who are at a, you know, uh, uh, who are at a divide can have in bringing those communities together. And so I think that's the aspect of his story uh, that really, you know, kind of fuels me and propels me. And so that's the one that I like uh, always to think of and remember when I'm uh, on this topic. So thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think when it comes to reaching out, some of it is just that it's, it's my job. Um, and I don't even necessarily mean that uh, to working out across uh, the political lines or within the House. Look, there are some things that can only get done when we all work together. And I think there have been some really good examples of that where we've had unanimous uh, agreements. Sometimes it's, uh, <laughs> it's a challenge to come up with something we'll all agree on. But actually, actually, I will say, when after the invasion of Ukraine a year ago, I remember standing on the steps of the legislature and people from every party were there. I think I was standing next to James Bazan. Right, and uh, there was a real, it was a sense of relief, um, as well as of unity, uh, even though it's, on a, it's, it's around a really tragic situation. But the other is that it's a sort of a sense that, uh, you know, sometimes people will, will talk about equality and treating every, and, and part of that means that you have a fundamental obligation to deal with everybody fairly, even when they don't agree with you. Um, and that's what I have to do as, as the leader, sorry, no, even as an MLA, if I have somebody who didn't vote for me, or even somebody, <laughs> actually there were people who wrote in right after I got elected to say, you know, I didn't vote for you, but I want some stuff from you anyway, um, which was fine. Okay. Um, you get lots of those, I'm sure, Kelly. I wrote the letter. Oh, yeah, yeah, that was right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know you lived in St. B. <laughs> Um, but that's part of it is that it is, is to remind yourself that you have an obligation to you really do somebody comes e somebody emails you is somebody comes knocking on your door you can't ask you know there there can't be a litmus test as to whether you're going to work with them or not but the other is that it's the only way a lot of things will ever get done is that you actually have to be able to is is that sometimes you need you need to have conflict and there was a great there's an episode of a a radio show called This American Life where they talked about, um, okay, this is, what, this is the story that reminds me. It was somebody who could predict divorces, and he figured out, so what they would do is they would get a couple together and they would give them topics to argue about, and they could tell by how they argued whether it would last or not. And the thing that made the difference was contempt, is that you could actually have people who were very angry and shouting each, at each other, but they were still actually communicating. So you'd be saying, it's like, well, just give me a chance to speak. It's like, okay, go ahead, right? That they're actually, they're angry, but they're actually believing there is a degree of communication that's going on. But when it went downhill was when it became, when it, when it became highly critical and, and, and contempt started to creep in. So that's, that's one of the challenges. And the other is about focusing who you're being critical of 
which I think again goes back to um, Kelvin's comments is that you don't want to punch down. Is you is that it's you you aim you, you hold people to account, people who are leaders and people who are in power, but you don't go after you don't go after followers because they're not actually the ones making the decisions, right? Is that you want to be it's about it's about picking the right people and holding them to account. So even if you're disagreeing, it can be done. Look, it's not even done respectfully sometimes, but it but sometimes the communicate but. If you can, you can still pick up communication. Sometimes, unfortunately, it's like a hockey game, right? Everybody goes out. They, you run people into the boards a couple of times, and then you go out for beer afterwards. Um, but and there's a degree. But the important thing is being able to remember and still remember and care for people. And 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 there are times when you think about the the bitter disagreements or the stuff you'll see in the media or some because stories, especially newspapers, stories are about conflict. You don't. There's no newspaper around the world that just is nothing, I don't think, that is nothing but all stories about people getting along together and everything, right? Um, that's not how story, that's not how exciting stories work. But there are, there are certainly times when we all work together and it's been, um, I would say, one is when we uh, mark condolences for, M, for M, fellow MLAs because it's just, reckon, and, and, and again, it's, it's something that's very special that the, the public does not see, that is, uh, but it's one of those breaks from, the, the, the sparring that we do um, that reminds us all of our, our fundamental humanity in, in the house. Thank you. So I don't know uh, many media that just report on positive things, but I think the closest I know is Golden West Radio. Elmer Hildebrand is in the house and lots of positive news. Well, I'm not getting the Daily Bond and Andrew, but, but uh, thank you, Elmer, for what you and your news stations do. Um, so there was two sort of parts of this question. One was motivation, then one was sort of hope. Uh, motivation for me um, is because I see what's going on. And, and I, Canada's not perfect. Canada's made lots of mistakes. Uh, there's lots of things trying to be done, I think, to address some of those mistakes. But I love Canada, and I think our system of government is not perfect, but it's as good as what I know in the world. But I see what's going on, and some of that's echoed in the United States. The United States, I would say, is probably in a worse situation. I read a study, I think it was in spring of last year, so maybe it was about a year ago, and it was an American study, and it said that 32% of Americans not only didn't trust their institutions, so government, big education, health care, um, the media, but they actively believed that those institutions were trying to hurt them and their family. So not just didn't trust them, but believed that they're trying to hurt them and their family. And I, and I suspect that the, it wouldn't be as quite as dire in Canada, but I, I, it's probably worse than what we might think in terms of what people think about institutions. And it's really difficult. If that number at 32% grows to 40 or 45 or 50, you can't really hold the democratic system together if the majority of people not only don't agree with the policy decisions of the institutions, and that's one thing, but really believe that those institutions are trying to hurt them and their family, and that's what worries me. And it's caused me actually to reflect on how I approach issues as well, because I don't want to feed into that. And again, it's entirely appropriate to, appropriate, to question institutions, to question government, and to question, why is the Bank of Canada raising interest rates? And it's entirely, it's entirely appropriate to ask those questions. I worry when a great percentage of people are saying, Bank of Canada's doing that because they're trying to hurt my family. Government's doing this because they're trying to, uh, to hurt us. That is a challenge and a problem for us, and we as leaders have to take special responsibility for that. Where I get hope uh, is sometimes you see the opposite. When kids come to, when children come to question period, um, after question period, we, or sometimes before, we get a chance to talk to them. So usually after question period, particularly if they're younger, I spend a lot of time apologizing for what they see in question period and trying to, well, you know, explain why it turned out this way and why it looked worse in their classroom and this and that. And, and I was doing this one time with a, with a class from Steinbeck and there was a young person who put their hand up and they said, Mr. Gertson, I want to tell you that in my country where I came from, I could never speak about government that way. I could never question government that openly and that, that strongly. They were not allowed to do that. And I realized that that, that is very important. It's, it's not okay to be personal and to question the values of, of those institutions and whether they're trying to hurt you. 
But if Dugold or, or Jamie gets up and questions me as a government official and said, well, I don't believe in your policy, I think that's the wrong policy, that's not a bad thing to do. And, and for those who can't do that in their countries, it's actually a very important thing to do. So we need to distinguish between what we're breeding. It's okay to talk about questioning and to challenge your government institution. When you're doing it to the point where you're, you're suggesting that those institutions are evil and trying to harm you and you're breeding that, I really worry what that does to Canada. So my motivation is to not allow that percentage to grow any greater and to challenge myself of, of the things that I can do to better that or where I've done, things I've done to maybe make that worse. Uh, but then also to remember that, that young person who said, I, I don't come from a country where you can challenge government and try to make sure that that still is allowed. Thanks again for giving us more insight into those stories that uh, nurture you. Our third question is an invitation for you to share more from your personal life, um, for your own story, and the role that identity plays in your ability to cross political or social divides. Um, this time, we're gonna start in the middle, so Mr. Moses, if you wouldn't mind to go first, and we'll go to Mr. Lamont, then Minister Gertson, and then we'll come back to you, uh, Ms. Benzies, at the end. So again, the question is, please share some of your own story and the role that your identity plays in your ability to cross political or social divides. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, I think that's a really important because we're all centered in our own identity and it uh, informs everything we do, how we interact with people. And so being you know, a black man in politics is unique. In fact, myself, uh, uh, MLA Audrey, or Minister Audrey Gordon and MLA Yuzoma Azaguera are the first three black MLAs ever elected in the Manitoba, the three of us elected in 2019. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and so, um, you know, being one of those people, it's not like there is a necessarily a roadmap to model my, 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 you know, my path after uh, other people. You kind of have to figure it out yourself. And so when you get into a space like the Manitoba legislature that is not necessarily built with the design for you know uh, black people to be in there necessarily, you know you kind of get that impression is that am I really really welcome here? I mean, there's no sign on the door that says like you know I'm not allowed in. It's kind of the vibe and the feeling and the you know the intention with which, which that space was created is it really created with me in there? And so part of my job is to represent the 20,000 people in, in St. Vital and to represent you know, my community, but it's also to hold space in the Manitoba legislature and be an MLA with a voice, because there hasn't been a voice like that before ever. And uh, speaking of that voice, I wanted to say that you know, the first time, on my very first day in there in the chamber, of course I'm nervous, I just got elected, um, I got up on my very first day for a member statement. The member statement happens basically at the start of the, of, uh, of the session. And my member statement was on, uh, is a two minute period where we get to speak on, on a topic. And I spoke on a woman named Inez Stevenson. Now I, Inez Stevenson, if you don't know, was a black woman who was elected as a school trustee in the Winnipeg School Division in the 1970s. And the first black elected official, uh, you know, as the story goes, in Manitoba. And um, I reason I spoke about with her, with her son viewing in the chamber, was because I wanted to frame my own work in the work on people who had broken those barriers before me. And to start off my work as an MLA, to thank those people, to say I want to s progress the work that you've already done, and use that as a measuring stick for what I do is in my career, but also as a benchmark and then say, you know what, I hope that someday someone can be breaking even further ground than I am right now. And so that's, you know, a little bit of my identity in, uh, in my role as an MLA. And I just want to, to end by saying that, you know, I carry my identity wherever I am, wherever I go, whether that's in the legislature, whether I'm canvassing and knocking on people's doors, whether I'm in communities and holding space with all of you. And you know, I'm proud of that identity. And I, what I want to share is that I hope people, wherever they are, can be also proud of their identities too, and not feel like they have to hold back, not feel like they have to change themselves for whatever space that they're in. And I also hope that that space, the other people who are with them, 
can accept them for exactly who they are. Oh, it's me. Thank you, Jamie. Um, yeah, I, I come from, my, my family, my mother's from England, and my dad grew up, uh, was born in Canada. He was born in the middle of the Depression. And uh, my dad's side of the family was, was very liberal. My, my grandfather, uh, John Lamont, was the first, he was the first lawyer to ever have a Ukrainian and a Jewish partner. Um, yeah, he worked with Métis people in the 1930s. Um, and, you know, the rule, whatever the rule is about you're not supposed to discuss uh, religion or politics did not apply in my house because that's almost all we talked about. My, my older, my father's older sister, her name was Mary Lamont, was the head of the League for Life Manitoba. She was the head of the, she was the president of the pro-life, the pro-life organization in Manitoba. She lived on our, uh, on our attic. And if you can imagine, there aren't, when you're 15, you don't really want to hear your aunt talking about that subject all day long for hours and hours, for years on end, which is, I don't like it as a topic because I've, I've hit my saturation point. Um, but it, I was also exposed to all those arguments. She was also, my aunt, was in the first all-female law partner in the 1970s with a woman named Marion Meadmore, who was the first First Nations woman to be called to the bar in Canada. But my grandmother, my mother's mother, was from Northern Ireland, which is, she was a Northern Irish Protestant from a place called Armagh, which is the point of the murder triangle, which is to say there were there's hundreds of years of deep hatred, and it's not just deep hatred between people who look different. They look exactly the same because they could be related to one another, and you can actually, she was Protestant, and she hated Catholics. Uh, she had an irrational hatred for Catholics. So my brother converted to Catholicism, not because of that. <laughs> Maybe because of that. And so did my older sister. And I didn't know that I wasn't supposed to let anyone know. So I was the one who broke the news to my grandmother by accident in letters. Because I wasn't told I was supposed to be keep quiet for it about it. My uncle, my dad's dad, was a had been a liberal for a long time, but he and my aunt were founding members of the Reform Party. Um, in fact, my uncle sat next to Stephen Harper at the founding convention here in Winnipeg. So but we all still talked. <laughs> and very loudly sometimes. And the, the thing about it is that, so there were all these forces on my family. And the other thing is if, if the thing about the Northern Irish conflict is that, so growing up, it was the thing called the Troubles. 3,000 people died, 1,500 people on either side. And one of my best friends growing up here in Winnipeg was Catholic. And, and he was from another community nearby. And we both knew that when we were 18 or 19, that instead of drinking beer and playing video games in a basement, we would have been trying to kill each other. And it would have been just because we were each other for that. And, and we knew people who were threatened. We knew people who were, um, I'm sure he had cousins who were in the IRA. I'm not sure. I think most of my family had left um, because it was too miserable. Because I, and I had, a, I had a great uncle, his gerrymandering, the term gerrymandering comes from, they used to go from door to door and his job was to deny Catholics the right to vote. Uh, and he told, he, he gave it up and he, he, I think he just, he quit his job as, a, as working for his landlord and said, I'm leaving and left for Australia. So, oh, uh, sorry, and that was it. I also forgot that my, <laughs> I shouldn't forget, my brother married a woman from Africa who was also, I think I, that was another letter I wrote to my grandmother, which was a big surprise because but, and look, and my mother, my mother was also very right wing, but it, it sounds very strange to my mother who was born in England is now an African matriarch, but there, we've brought a number of refugees over from Zimbabwe who look up to her and, and we send money back to Zimbabwe. And so part of it is having this very open family with enormous commitment to hospitality, but also recognizing that if it, being very, very grateful about what we have here in Canada and being very cautious about, I don't like people I don't want people, like when I say people, I'm actually talking about, <laughs> I don't want the conflicts that murdered people, that, that killed people, until the 1990s. I mean, Ireland is only three million people. We were talking, if there were a civil war in Canada, tens of thousands of people would have died. Um, and so part of it is just recognizing that terrible damage that can happen and being, I'm, for that reason, I'm very appreciative. But the other thing about it is, what do I have to do to actually hold my family together? <laughs> and it is because 
because there may be all these deep divisions, but to find that one little circle of the Venn diagram of the things we can still talk about, or the things, and 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 with some somehow, and it's it is, and but that's part of it is that it's, and uh, yeah, my family is exceptional. I think I don't <laughs> I don't think that's the average upbringing, but it was a very unique perspective for me, in 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 how important it is to be able to bridge to, to still bridge those divides. And actually, I'll say this about my grandmother. She was hilarious. She was charming. She was a great cook. She was a great entertainer. She was funny. But it also taught me that somebody who's very, very nice can have bad, can have very unpleasant views. And the thing about it is we didn't, we loved her despite those things, but we didn't take her views seriously because we knew that, because she was, <laughs> at least she wasn't running anything, right? That was the key thing. Um, but but these, are, these are all ideas that I, I sort of grew up in this very odd, um, and unique, I think, but I'm very lucky to have had that experience, but it, it, it's, that's part of what carved out my unique views on, on, on politics. And I also grew up, I just grew up as a Gen Xer, where I was going to school with people from all backgrounds and people from all, I, it, it was the beginning of um, new immigration and I was going to school with Métis kids and, and there were huge, huge political upheavals at certain times of my political the formative years, like Meech Lake, uh, Meech Lake, the collapse of the Berlin Wall. These are all these massive uh, referendums on whether Canada was even going to stay together. These are all things, and it's it's like how do you? Some of it is just the things you have. What do you have to do to get people to find that common, those common elements? And 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 to reflect on Jamie, is that and is that forgiveness is a huge part of it, and it's the hardest thing because I think when we think of justice or making things right, we often very much think of punishment. But that's punishment is not the same thing as justice. Is that it can be part of it, but forgiveness uh, forgiveness has to be considered as part of it as a way of I say well how, if we're going to depolarize what do we have to do to make things right for 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 everyone and that's and and one of the roads through that is I think is through forgiveness and amends. It isn't just saying and I'll say uh, sorry, sorry I sorry to go on but it's not it's a difference between just saying I'm sorry and between saying. I'm asking for your forgiveness because that's something I may have to earn. Uh, my father died when I was 11. He was an alcoholic. He died from his uh, from his disease. Lots of alcohol, alcoholism in my in my family on on both sides. So we just sort of grew up with that, and it caused lots of uh, unique um, growing up situations as as a young person. So when he when he died, he left uh, my my mom and my sister in a pretty precarious situation. He was a wonderful man, by the way, but he had a disease, and and uh, it left us in a pretty tough spot. So my mom moved us into government housing uh, at uh, at the time, and we lived there for for several years. And I won't get into all the uh, some divine and some uh, some other reasons and ways that we sort of got from a family uh, ripe with um, with addictions and government housing to the place where I am today, but it was because there was a lot of people who, um, some knowingly and some unknowingly, did a lot of things that, that benefited uh, me. i use an example of someone who wouldn't have done it purposely, for me in particular, but Jim Penner, and I, some of you, I think, are of the age, you might remember Jim Penner and Penner Foods. He had a grocery store in, um, in, in Winnipeg and Steinbach and a couple other places in southern Manitoba, and he paid significantly more than the industry average required him to do, and I was lucky enough to get a job there, and it really gave me the opportunity to go to university, and while Jim and I became good friends uh, in his later years, he didn't do that because of me in particular. He didn't know me at that time. He did that because he wanted to give back in a certain way, but it helped me. Uh, and it's difficult to be a polarizing person when you're trying to help a lot of people overall. And so I think about people like Jim Penner and others who are giving, who are trying to, to help people uh, in a lot of different ways. Um, and then I think about my personal faith. Um, I'm, I'm a believer. Uh, I'm a Christian, so I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. I've never made a secret of that as, as a politician, and it's, it's impacted my life in a lot of different ways. And I've sometimes thought about the, 
the life of, of Jesus himself, how he met with a lot of people who would have been considered unseemly at the time, tax collectors and people of ill repute. And I wonder how he would have been viewed today because we've sort of taken this situation today where if you meet with somebody who has a bad reputation or meets with somebody who has different values in you, we do what I've labeled as we do value transferring. You think, well, that person is talking to that person, so they must share the same values. Well, not necessarily, and there's a danger, I think, in doing that. There's a danger in doing that because if you assume that somebody who is talking to somebody else, uh, you assume that they have the same values and you go and you say, well, those two must feel exactly the same way, it certainly makes it difficult for you, and particularly us as politicians, to go and talk to a lot of people then, because that runs a risk. It runs a danger. The people are gonna say, oh, you were talking to somebody and I know that person believes in something, you know, that, that I don't agree with, so you must believe in the same thing. And that increases polarization because it increases the risk when you went, go and talk to somebody who has different values and different beliefs than you. So I'm informed by a lot of different things. Some of it is my own personal background growing up in the, um, in the environment uh, that I did and knowing that I would never be in a place like I am this evening talking to you wonderful people in this beautiful facility if not for a lot of people who didn't know me but who did things in their life because they believed in the common good as my friend Gordon Damon often says the common good and they believe in those sort of things and then I'm informed by my own faith and, and recognizing that it's okay to talk to people who don't believe in the same thing that you do, and it's okay to reach out to people and speak to them, even if they don't feel exactly you do. That's actually the essence of our humanity, and it shouldn't be taken as a bad thing as it often is today. Okay. <clears throat> well, I've touched a little bit on my identity already, um, but I guess I'll start at the beginning. Um, <clears throat> When we are all born, we know that we pretty quickly recognize the parts of ourselves that are <clears throat> not immediately okay or acceptable or might be polarizing. And it, um, and so as a Métis, non-heteronormative woman, there's a lot there that's polarizing. So for most of, for all of my childhood and youth and some of adulthood, um, because of some of the privileges that I have, including being white presenting, I was able to exist in a lot of spaces and blend in or fit in. So I could exist in, um, I'll say white spaces or spaces with settler descendants and fit right in. I was able to feel at home also in First Nations, Métis nations. Um, and that was how I liked it, was just being able to fit right in. Um, I was good at sports, so I could kind of fit in with the boys and I could also kind of fit in with the girls and, and that's, that was the comfy place to be. Um, I suppose my, pro my more recent project as an adult is to bring all of myself to all of the spaces um, and maybe even go so far as to um, recognize when it's a settler space to bring my I indigenous um, identity and when it's an indigenous space, um, bring settler perspectives or or the like. So, um, the question, to get back to the question, which was um, how does our identity inform our ability or desire to cross divides, um, or something like that, Jody, you can, I think that was some, how you put it. Um, you know, I, my father is a uh, descendant of settlers. Um, part of the colonial project, and my mother is an indigenous woman, and in a sense, my parents couldn't be further apart on like a polar continuum. A continuum. Um, and I grew up in that home. And so what I used to think of as a curse, being a person that didn't fit en in anywhere because um, of the, all these uncomfortable things that I've been told aren't okay, um, I consider all of the parts of me a gift that allows me to relate across the continuum. And so um, 
that is how I approach my identity now, and I think of all of those things about me that are different as a gift and a way to relate. So, yeah. Thank you again for allowing us to a little bit more into your lives and sharing from your personal stories, your families, um, the stories that shape you. Um, before we begin the question and answer period, um, where I will ask you to formulate your question or comment in approximately 30 seconds at the microphone. Um, I'm gonna invite some conversation among you. Um, you got to have a, a few jokes back and forth, I think, Mr. Lamont and, and Minister Gerstin. Um, but were there other things that you wanted to say to one another or questions of clarification among you? Well, well, I often wonder sometimes, uh, Jamie, because I've, I've had the experience of talking to Audrey in, in our caucus, and, um, and then I hear from individuals, uh, yeah, so just Jim Rose. Uh, then I hear from individuals sometimes, um, in fact, it was just, um, I think, a British Columbia uh, NDP MLA, I think, who resigned and said that they felt that they were in a hostile environment in the legislature. From your perspective, um, being among the first black individuals elected to the legislature, do, do you feel any of that? I mean, is there hostility or things that, that we're doing that, that don't make you feel as, as welcome as we might otherwise want to? Yeah. Thanks, I appreciate the question. Um, I'll give you one example. And so, uh, we enter the building every day, right, when we go to work. I don't know about you, but how, how often you maybe get asked or questioned by the security who go into the building, right? But it wasn't until my third year as an MLA that they recognized me and let me in. It was the routine when I went to the front door that they would ask to either see ID or say, well, who are you? I say, I'm the MLA for St. Patel. Same thing driving in the building. And so it wasn't until my third year, because normally when you're in the building, you have to show ID, unless you're one of the MLAs who usually just walk in because this is your place of work, or if you have a staff badge. So it wasn't until my third year that they started to recognize this. So this is kind of an, I don't know whether, how you, how you would describe this, but for me, this was a sign that the people who are running this building, who are set to control this area and this space, were not prepared for someone like me to work here as an MLA. And so now, hopefully, they're more prepared for black people to be in that space. And hopefully, in the future, when there are more and other black MLAs, they don't have to face that. They can be already more welcome into the legislature. I had no idea, and it's the first time you shared this story with me. So if, if I think if that might be the most uh, powerful thing I'll take away tonight. Thanks for sharing that. I'll take that back. Thank you. And, and so hopefully now you've come up with your questions. Again, the idea is we have one microphone here. You're welcome to come up and to frame your question. We invite you to speak for approximately a maximum of, of 30 seconds, just so that we can give the time uh, for people to be able to respond to them. If you have a particular person that you would like to ask the question of, please address them. Also realize that we want to give questions um, across the panel. So please come up um, and share your questions. Um, I'll, I'll ask a question, but I'll make a very quick observation. I appreciated the, uh, the identity-based questions, really. Uh, um, as a newcomer to Winnipeg in the fall of 2020, I, like all newcomers, I went to the Forks and I saw a statue of Gandhi. And then I said, what's Gandhi's statue doing here in Winnipeg? <laughs> that every class I asked that question to whose statue should be there, Everybody says it should be an indigenous person. Uh, but it's still, I'm still perplexed by uh, Gandhi's statue at the Forks. So the, qu uh, uh, the, the question of identity is a good one, and I appreciate that. Here's my question. I appreciate Jamie, your, this Jamie's <laughs> uh, point about how polarization often assumes that there are these two extremes, right? So my question to maybe uh, each of you, if you have a, a few moments to address it, uh, each of you, is how do you talk about polarization in the context of something like domination? Like, how do we talk about polarization in that context? I'll, I'll start if that's okay. No, that's, that's a great question. Um, 
for Gandhi, I oh, sorry, I'll start with Gandhi. I think it's because he's a global human rights figure. <laughs> like, I think that's, and he got his, 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 and there were some folks here who wanted to make sure he was represented. But I think there's two things that happen, or there's lots of things that happen, but I mentioned it before that it's, that I think polarization out publicly is driven by, is driven by desperation. So, um, because I used to, and I used to teach a little bit at the University of Winnipeg, in, it was called government business relations, but one of the things that happens is if you have a big financial crash, uh, what follows very often, um, there was a, a paper, they looked at 140 different countries. You have a big financial crash, all the banks lose their money, everybody loses their money, there's no mortgages, there's no money around. And often what happens is that um, countries will go one of two ways. Either they become more socialist, well, they're actually three. Either they become more socialist, or they become more authoritarian and hard right wing, or they might even become national socialist. And, and it really is in part being driven by desperation because people's needs aren't being met financially. And in fact, there's no way, um, and one of the things that happens is that when you have a collapse, you have people who had something and then they lose it. So people are powerless. It's, it's driven by desperation and a lack of power uh, for sort of publicly the, among big groups in society. But then at the same time, you might have groups who are trying to maintain control. So they could be maintaining control because they're actually just trying to maintain law and order because you've got riots and other things going on. But the other is they might be trying to maintain control because they want to stay in power and they actually don't want to help. And I think one of the things is that it, a lot of polarization and whether it's protests or riots and, and uprisings, they're, driv they're driven by that sort of sense of communal pain, uh, where, uh, of, of desperation, and, and, but also by the inability sometimes of authorities to meet those needs. Um, and so that's, and it's one of the reasons why it's very important to make sure that people have the necessities of life, not just because it's humane um, and because everybody is equal and, and, and deserves and, and should have those fundamental necessities of life, but because it actually, I had a saying, is the worse you treat people, the more it's gonna cost you in the end. So if we actually have that approach that if we're gonna treat people, if we actually, you can actually treat people better and, 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 and ensure it's, it's actually really a kind of peacemaking. I actually think that's one of the, 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 the alternatives or the solutions to what we're talking about in terms of polarization is, is peacemaking. And, and that gives, that's a give and take and that's a thing that's negotiated and it can't be punitive. And that's part of it is that the other two great lessons after the First World War, they punished, uh, the victors punished and punished and punished the, the, the people who lost. And John Maynard Keynes in 1919 said he quit the peace talks and he said, uh, the way this is going, there's gonna be another war in Europe in 20 years, and he was right. And then after the Second World War, they did the opposite. They said, you know what, we're gonna reach out and we're gonna help rebuild Europe and we're gonna invest and we're gonna lend so that we don't, uh, so it doesn't happen again. And I think that's part of what, that's, it was called the Marshall Plan, but I mean, some of that is to say we need to reach out and we need to help people, um, and, and including the people who are, who, who say um, who say they're opposed to us? It's critical. Thank you. Anyone else on the panel want to offer for that? Uh, yeah, I can add, uh, add some thoughts to that. So you ask about the dominant, the large population against maybe a small group. And to answer, I'll go back a little bit to my Christian faith and offer uh, you know a Bible story. Some of you might know this kind of the story of the Good Shepherd, right? Jesus, the Good Shepherd, taking care of his flock of 100 sheep. One gets lost, right? And so Jesus, you know, the Good Shepherd goes and finds the lost sheep. And for me, that's about, you know, really that's a story about equity, right? That's a story about the Good Shepherd uses, the re uses his resources to help the one, leaving the 99, and really helping the one who needs the help the most. That's equity, right? And I think that's the approach that that, mess, that story teaches us that we ought to be taking. But what that story also tells us is that in the Good Shepherd leaving and helping the one, he's also relying on the 99 to be okay with that, to accept the dominant group, to accept the fact that we need to help and put more resources into the one. So it calls, it's a call to action on that 99 to be okay with that. And then when that one sheep is returned to the flock, it's a call to action for all the 99 to celebrate, 
to celebrate and say that that person is back in the fold. And so it's really when we're dealing with these polarizations with the, with, uh, with the dominant group, I think that's a good story to keep in mind that equity is something that we need to, you know, we ought to really be focused on and that there is a call to action for that dominant group to be part of that because it is how we actually have a functioning society when we can all celebrate lost, you know, bring back a lost someone when we have the majority group celebrate um, someone coming back into the fold. Maybe add, um, <clears throat> I appreciate that perspective, but I'm gonna go a bit of a different direction. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what you were getting at with your question, but I'm wondering if maybe there's an assumption that um, the main perspective is so if the main perspective is the dominant perspective, there's maybe a misconception that that would be the majority and that the extreme poles are the, the radicals that are the minority. And I'm, I guess I'm going to answer your question with a question, which is um, we, we just have to take a keen eye to who is measuring polarization, who is telling us what are, are the poles, and a dominant culture doesn't necessarily mean the majority of the people, it just is the loudest voice or the voice that has had the biggest platform. Um, and so, although that may be dominant, it's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily represent the most people or the people's best interests. Um, so I don't have like an answer per se, but just kind of that is how I would approach your question, or that's how I think about your question, is that dominant doesn't necessarily mean majority, and the extremes and the radicals aren't necessarily the minority. It, um, they're just the voices with the um, fewest platforms or, yeah. And, and just quickly to pick up on Jamie's point, I think there's a responsibility for all of us, whether we think we're in the you know, polarized extremes on either side or in the dominant views in the middle, whatever our perception of that might be, uh, to lead with the question of why does somebody else feel the way they feel? And that certainly didn't happen a lot during the pandemic, and I think I was guilty of that too. And I learned that a little bit as we went along to, to stop trying to suggest why people should feel the way they should feel or feel the way I feel, but to start with the question, why do you feel the way you feel? You, you may not, uh, you probably won't necessarily agree with their position on it, but it does get you to a better place. Then when you start to understand, when you try to understand why a person feels a certain way, it may not cause you to believe their position, but I think it softens your view towards their position because you can usually find some commonality in that, even if it's vulnerability or other sorts of things you might have felt at some point. And I think that all of us should have learned in the last couple of years to start with a question rather than a solution on people. And I'm trying a lot more when I get different sorts of things come at me to start with, why do you feel that way? And then move from there. We still may not end up on common ground, um, but I think we end up in a place of much better sort of respect. Thank you. Thank you for all your uh, perspectives and thoughts on that. Uh, is there another question that people would like to answer? Excuse me, offer. First off, I want to thank you for all your contributions tonight. As an educator, I have the good fortune of guiding grade nine students through questions about government. And as we've heard tonight, our system has elements that are worth celebrating. It also has elements that are maybe exclusionary or even oppressive. So instead of just apologizing to students for the debacle that is question period, what is one structural change that we could make to government to reduce polarization? I think this is a I think it's, uh, I think it's, it's, it's I think it's, as the government house leader, oh. <laughs> I think you feel like you is a little bit in your alley here. There, there, there's an old, um, <laughs> there, there was somebody who at one point tried to um, not allow political parties to sit with each other. And it was the notion of where, where you sit determines where you stand. And it, it had the idea of trying to mix people up and so that they could, you know, sort of share different views and, and those sort of things. I think that that's, a part of it for sure. Um, I do think we need to start to look at when it comes to question period or other parts of, of um, the debate in the legislature to separate out 
things that we consider to be policy and things that we consider to be personal. Uh, and that can be done sometimes through the rules, but ultimately rules don't go very well in a, in a combative environment like that. I think it really ends up with political parties meeting with each, with, with each other more and recognizing, this was my point before, that we have not just a collective responsibility, but it's, 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 our, it's our business that's at stake. Because if people continue to lose confidence in us as political leaders, we are ultimately going to bear, when we think we are already, bearing some of the brunt of that. So I, I do think rules are part of that. When people always say, oh, I change rules of question period. In an environment like that, that can be challenging. But I do think that there's, there's real room for us as political leaders to come together and say, listen, Dougal and I, and we've had some good uh, spars, and Jeremy, Jamie and I have, but, but we sit down and we, we talk about things because we have respect for each other as individuals, even if we don't always agree with each other on a position. And, and I just think it's incumbent upon us to do that. And sometimes we have to call out people within our own party, which is really, really hard because that can sometimes feel like an issue of loyalty or feel like an issue of trust. But if we, as we continue on, if this continues on down this road, I think there is a responsibility for us. I don't mean go to the free press necessarily, but speak to each other in, in our caucuses that way. I'll, I'll, I'll just briefly touch on it. I think, no, it is funny, I was just when you were talking about, yeah, look, I have three seats in the legislature and I'm the moderate middle. So, um, but in terms of, like, I think I, I will say in, in, after the 2019 uh, election, there were still times I would sit in the House where we lost a seat. And I was I thought, you know, it is really quite incredible that we have a question period where I get to ask questions of the premier. And he has he doesn't have to answer, but he does have to stand up and say something <laughs> or she. No, this was in this is I'm talking about this is what this is. This is 2019. Yeah. So um, so we do have an incredible that that ability it is hard but the other thing about it is there are also some extremely very very tough issues and i was thinking about this as well is that um and the, the pandemic showed this it, it, it's and i don't i do not envy in any way that the choices government had to make but we we really make we make life and death decisions in that in that place right so it gets very it can get very heated the the room itself seems to be designed to broadcast emotion. I don't know if you've, but you know, somebody will say something and all of a sudden there'll be a hush that sweeps over the room. There are times that we've been able to work together. I think that if we had, if we had more all party committees, but that's not really question period. I think the issue of freedom of speech is that free, there's two things. One is that freedom of speech really is supposed to be more about challenging and fighting ideas than about challenging and fighting people. So if you are just attacking somebody's character or um, it's different going after something personal and, and, and or as opposed to going after something, their their record, right? The decisions they've made on policy, those are, those are different. Um, I think, like I think maybe if the speaker threw people out more often, it might help, including me. But but, um, but we we're we're actually talking about this. We're 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 trying. We have an all-party committee to to try to to address some of this, in, in to figure out how do we how do we bring the the heat down? Because before I was elected MLA, I was elected leader, and I would sit up in the in and it, it it's something to watch, but it's also because when you sit in the gallery above, it's, it's actually out of the eye line of all MLAs. So as far as you're concerned, you see the people ahead of you and you don't see anyone in the audience who are up above. So all you, and, and I could see two sides very much focused on one another and it can get personal, it can get heated. Um, and, and some of it is because, some of it is because uh, stakes are high, some of it um, is because uh, somebody's rude, but, um, I think there are certain things we can do to reduce the amount of, either if it's an innuendo of uh, suggesting that, because the one thing I'm, it's quite, it's, it's an odd thing about parliamentary privilege is that I can accuse someone of a crime, but I can't call them a liar. Um, uh, yeah, I can't, yeah, and, and, and that's, that's, that's because you're not, I don't know why you accusing someone of a crime is not supposed to call, you're not supposed to call in the honor of the people, other people in, they're all, we're all supposed to be honorable, right? And you're not supposed to call question that into question by suggesting someone is a liar or that they're preventing. Um, and so 
but I'll say very often, what we 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 there's a thing, and it grates at me is the idea that when people say, well, you're putting false information on the record, is or there are these things that sort of skirt around that, and and it's not, it's not it's not out and out, but I find it wearing. I find it morally wearing. That's uh, one of the challenges. And it's, and it's just a very, I mean, I, 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 sorry, I'll say, but just I feel anxious every single time. I can feel my anxiety rising every single time before I have to ask a question. So it's an anxious place. You have all sorts of things. There's, there's no, and yeah, and, it's, and you're out there fighting, like fighting in public in a very controlled way. But it maybe just needs to be just a little more controlled. Thank you. And Mr. Moses, yes. Okay. Thanks. Um, I want to thank you for the question as well, and thank you for educating grade nine students. As Kent, I'm sure that's a challenge. I've, I speak, I've spoken with a number of grade nine students recently for Black History Month. I've been at a lot of schools, and I know I can understand how challenging grade nine can be. So thanks for doing that. Um, to answer your question, I think I first thought is that nobody is all good and nobody is all bad, and we have to take that into consideration with the words that we're speaking in the, in the house. And your question is calling on for us to be more compassionate in our, uh, in our speech and in our uh, attitude and our behavior in the legislature, and I think that's really important. But the challenge with it is that there's not really a space for us to listen to each other in there very well. It's not set up for us to listen. And we all, as we've been speaking all night, right, it's about building these bonds to get through the divide, and you can't do that without listening, right? And so if there was another venue for us, maybe even outside of question period, before or after, just for us to have a time to talk, listen, get to know each other a little bit, I think that that would actually go a long way in building a little bit of more relationship between MLAs and hopefully allow us to be more compassionate with our speech and with our tone and attitude toward each other uh, during question period. The advantage of, as House Leader, I work with the opposition more than anybody else in our caucus, and I see that. I would say this, you know, to your grade nine students, there are other parts of the day of the legislature that, you know, estimates and that, which are quite boring, and people, Emily sort of questioning back and forth, but it's not question period. It's actually some thoughtful questions, and I would think thoughtful answers sometimes, maybe not always, but sometimes. Um, but then there's also lots of other things. When Jamie passed Black, uh, Black History Month, I think it went over, and a lot of people went and congratulated you and on, on doing that that and uh, sometimes people lose family members and they they come and speak to each other in the house and they exchange cards that Richard Cloutier I don't think would mind me saying this but when I got elected almost 20 years ago now uh, he said um, Kelvin I want to tell you something we don't report when the planes land safely we report when they crash and the reality is that that's true and 80% of the, of the bills that pass in the legislature pass by consensus they pass with all party support uh, that doesn't get reported but the reality is we do actually agree on uh, the vast majority of bills that come to the legislature and when there are tough times in each other's families i see it all the time where mlas rally uh, around each other and um, and are supportive of each other so tell your grade nine students that that what they see in that 45 minute period uh, isn't the only thing that ever happens in that legislature thank you for issuing that invitation also for thinking about sy systemic change for doing things differently for listening so tonight we have listened to some powerful. Sorry, can, I got Jamie there. Oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> not like more systemic, not even just question period, but systemic change that would reduce polarization in government. I have many imaginative dreams for how to flip government on its head. <laughs> um, they are probably polarizing opinions. Um, well, instead of drawing on my lack of experience in government, I will. Um, draw on something that Nahani Fontaine, also a minister, has, has said before, and um, I appreciate it. Um, her belief, um, and I know Nahani Fontaine has styles that uh, rub people the wrong way, and she isn't always the most cooperative, probably. I don't know. I'm not in that space. But um, her vision for um, systemic change would be better representation in the government. And I know that, uh, you know, a number of ministers are on the charge to see that Manitoba's population in all of its diversity is better represented in the government. Um, and there are a lot of hurdles and reasons why um, our government is not representative right now. But I think that if we 
did have um, better representation, then um, things would look different just by virtue of people bringing their different experiences and different cultural ways of knowing and thinking and um, if they're from other countries, different styles of governance. governance. And I think that um, with that would allow some much needed change in addition to a number of other things. But I think representation is very important and I think that a diversity of perspectives um, is, is the only way to govern a group of people, so. Thank you, thank you for adding that additional component of, of, of change that's needed. I wanna capture a little bit of what I've heard. I've heard to overcome polarization, we need to make connections. We need to honor human dignity. We need to see and recognize that we have some mutual goals, that we can be found, we can find ground, grounding and hope that it's okay to be critical. It's okay to recognize different power dynamics. That we need to share of our own self. That we need to build trust. Um, that we need to ask who has responsibility in different situations and be willing to take our responsibilities and listen to others. So those are a few of the different things I've heard. Um, I heard a very articulate story about Nelson Mandela. I heard about Northern Ireland. I heard about indigenous teachings on sharing circles, all things that nurture our um, panel in making the kind of change that they're required to do or that they're invited into uh, in their work and in their personal lives. So I'm grateful for hearing the stories tonight. I wanna thank our speakers, Mr. Gertson, Mr. Lamont, Mr. Moses, Ms. Menzies, for being here tonight, for sharing of yourself, for offering the stories, and for allowing us to feel some hope as we go forward. So as we go forward, I invite you to think about your story about tonight, what you may share with others as you depart. May you go with your story, discover another story, and go with hope. Thank you.